This is recording two of week one. So now we're looking at slide 11. It says China's significant limitations along the top. China is the largest example of uh, a country in Asia that has these problems that we were just discussing. Um, and they are as follows as I perceive them and as I've read about them over the years. Um, it's not to say that every single inch of China is rugged territory, not conducive to transportation, but there's an awful lot of it. The um, agricultural areas of China are relatively limited in size. The uh, areas that are mountainous, or as we say, not conducive to transportation, are more numerous uh, than in North America and indeed uh, in comparison to Europe. There are two main rivers, the Yangtze River, or the Yangtze River, as it's sometimes pronounced, and the Yellow River. The Yangtze River is, uh, or the Changjiang in Chinese, is in the north, and the Yellow River is uh, rather in the south, and the Yellow River is in the north. Um, and both of these rivers are navigable to a degree, the Yellow River less so. Um, but And there's, there are some other rivers too, but the amount of navigable river that can be used for commerce um, for ships that are large is much less in China than it is in the United States. Uh, there's this long coastline that you can see in the east. But there are island-produced uh, bottlenecks, you might call them, offshore. There's uh, Taiwan, there is Japan, um, there is uh, Okinawa and Guam. Um, these are all places where someone that is not friendly to China might station a military force past which Chinese ships would have to go. Um, and that's not a good thing if you want to be able to project power uh, overseas. Taiwan is a, a central issue that has many aspects to it, and we will go on to discuss that later in the course. The population is concentrated along this coastline. Um, this may um, uh, this does produce a significant um, economic advantage in some ways because coastal transportation is available that's cheap. It's always cheaper, by the way, to ship something on a boat than it is to do so on a road. Uh, that's more expensive than others. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, a little bit less. It's in the middle to ship it by um, train. So the cheapest is by boat. The next cheapest is by train and it's more expensive to ship things by road, um, but uh, we won't get into too much of that. It's, it's a simple matter of, um, of which countries have these advantages in facilitating trade or don't have the, those advantages. Um, these disadvantages that China has um, in comparison to the United States uh, are often overlooked by commentators today, this is where we get into the wheat versus the chaff sort of stuff. Uh, in essence, modern commentators who talk about China overtaking the United States ignore two key things. One is these geographic uh, geopolitical advantages that the United States has, and the other are demographic advantages that the United States has, uh, which we were just looking at, fewer people per square mile. Um, and uh, uh, an easier immigration system that allows in people who take risks and people who are, uh, who are daring, smart, uh, and so on. Um, the United States is constantly regenerating itself, you might say. Let's go on to slide um, 12. So this situation with China as an example um, leads to one where the Chinese leadership is always worried about consolidating control of its frontier regions. China has a core, and that core, if you're looking at a map of China, is 
along the coastline, not in the far north, the far northeast, um, and it's a bit into the interior, uh, to the to the absolute center of China, uh, bottom center, you might say, is Sichuan, the uh, the rice bowl of China, the great province uh, in the south central part of the country. Um, this marks the end of the Chinese core, which really only consists of about a third of the People's Republic. The rest of the People's Republic is considered by its, uh, its decision makers to be peripheral areas. They are much more lightly populated. Uh, they tend to be populated by ethnic minorities. Uh, there, are, there are policies in place to encourage Han Chinese, that is the people who are in the majority, H-A-N, Han, the Han Chinese, an ethnic group which uh, we think of as the Chinese. There are policies in place to encourage Han Chinese people to move out there into these peripheral areas. And indeed, if you were to go to Tibet today, uh, you'd land in Lhasa, the capital of the Tibetan Autonomous Region, and you would see lots and lots of Chinese people. 20 years ago, that was not the case. We'll go into more detail about this sort of thing in the coming weeks. Let's go on to slide 13. Mongolia, Japan, and Korea are a bit different. Um, the countries we were that I was trying to talk to before, which I can't do in detail at this stage of the game, which I would say are China, Thailand, Burma, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Um, they have uh, these, these problems with ethnic minorities, not getting along with the majority very well. Indeed, um, under, under circumstances that can easily change, but they'd be murdering each other. And these ethnic minorities tend to be on the peripheries, which makes them a threat because, of course, you want to protect your borders. You don't want your borders subverted by people you don't trust. Um, however, Mongolia, Japan, and Korea are a bit different. They have much better ethnic and linguistic unity. Um, however, there are uh, the two of them anyway. Um, Korea and Mongolia have historically been exposed to hostile neighbors, um, even Japan nowadays, uh, now that we're in the era of modern transportation and, and uh, jet aircraft uh, flight is common. Uh, even Japan is in this uh, category now. It's very easily exposed to its uh, hostile neighbors. And when I say that, I'm talking about Russia, China, and North Korea. Um, in traditional times, before the age of flight, Japan was the big exception to everything I've been talking about up until this time. Uh, they had uh, these stretches of ocean you see on the map protecting them from other countries. Uh, and indeed, as we'll talk about later, Japan was at the end of the road for European imperialist powers in the 19th century. It was, in essence, the farthest point away from Europe by ship. Therefore, it was the last one that was uh, hassled by the Europeans. And indeed, it ended up being the Americans who were first into Japan um, with any force. The Americans actually opened up, quote unquote, uh, Japan because for the Americans sailing from San Francisco, Japan was the closest country, but America was a late entry into the imperialist game. Anyway, um, like the United States, the Japanese sought to develop a powerful navy to prevent invasion once uh, they entered the modern age in the late 19th century. Um, so. They had these advantages over other Asian powers, uh, and we'll discuss more about that later, and it's one reason why they jumped ahead of the other Asian powers. However, Japan's natural resources are few. Uh, these narrow sea lanes that surround it are easy to blockade and, indeed, easy to cross. 
China's similar problem with its coastal area um, is that is that uh, it's easy to invade. It's hard to project power away, as we discussed a moment ago. Um, but in spite of that, uh, through history, China did not face very many. They faced occasional problems along the coast uh, in threats, but not too many. Uh, they faced east, in other words. Uh, historians like to say this. The Chinese have historically faced east. They paid more attention, in other words, to the coast through their history than they have the interior. Um, there had been exceptions. There had been the Mongols. There had been the Manchus. We'll talk more about that uh, in the next lecture. But even then, the priority uh, to the East Coast for development seems not to have declined. So we've summarized why geographical aspects are important. They're tied to the availability of resources. They're tied to the nature of threats, the ability to project power outside of your borders, and therefore opportunities for expansion in a dog-eat-dog -dog world where international law has uh, always been of very limited utility. Let's go on now to the next section. We'll skip past uh, slide 14. We're going to talk about why this course focuses on this 200-plus year period from 1800 to the present. Let's go on now to slide 15. In the short time of your lives, or at least of perhaps of your older siblings, China has gone from being <clears throat> a hopeful business opportunity in the late 1980s to a repressive regime killing its own people in 1989. This is all in the eyes of the West, of course. And then they gradually returned to being a big opportunity in the 1990s, a BRIC country. If you haven't heard of that, uh, you, you've heard it now, and you'll notice it in the newspapers and so on in the future. B-R-I-C, a BRIC country. That is the um, uh, Brazil, B-R-I-C, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, these, have always, these, these have also been called by, uh, by U.S. trade officials the, the big emerging markets. It is uh, places where the money is. So China, a BRIC country, um, has been looked upon as, uh, as, a, as a big market where there's a lot of development and foreign businesses can make substantial amounts of money. Um, and now, in 2013, there is talk of a decline in China's relations with its major trading partners and uh, and new laws and rules in China that disadvantage foreign companies and so on. So uh, the, the, um, the uh, image of China in the West has gone back and forth three times in your lifetimes. Uh, and you're all young. Um, and now there, there's also this thing about cyberspace. But anyway, um, meanwhile, Japan. Uh, has become less tolerant of China. There's even talk nowadays of a Sino-Japanese war once again. Um, there's already been two of them in the last uh, 100 plus years. Um, it used to be that one wouldn't even talk about that sort of thing in polite company. But anyway, there we are. Burma, um, continuing to talk about changes over the past decades. Burma, also known as Myanmar, uh, for decades was in the grip of a junta, military junta, that isolated it purposely, uh, that uh, tried to pursue what the regime called the Burmese way of socialism. Um, and suddenly, last year, they opened up to elections and Western influence, apparently to moderate what was becoming Chinese dominance of their, of their economy and indeed um, even excessive Chinese political influence. Um, during my life, and I was born in 1956, um, Vietnam has gone from being a cauldron of war allied to Russia and China. Um, now it's aligned with the United States. 
uh, in order to counter Chinese influence, which is not a new thing for them really. Um, over thousands of years, they've been trying to counter Chinese influence. And Vietnam is a maturing market. Um, North Korea, uh, again, looking back over decades, used to be uh, isolated, but it was competitive, both militarily and economically, with South Korea uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Now its economy is an absolute mess, um, although it's become a, perhaps it's a, a nuclear power. And South Korea, its, uh, its rival, is growing ever richer as North Korea grows ever poorer, ever more desperate. Over the past 200 years, the changes in this region are truly earth-shaking. Um, the uh, the um, dominant Chinese empire, which precipitously fell between 1842 and 1911 and was torn by war many times over, rose gradually after that albeit along a very rocky road, to become the world's second largest economy um, with what appears to be coming a world-class military. Uh, but some things have remained similar. Um, Korea's neighbors still look upon a united Korea as a potential problem because if one neighbor like Russia um, were to dominate a united Korea, this would make the Chinese and Japanese quite nervous, and vice versa. One reason why China, in its present form, will probably never want to allow Korean unity is because they do not want American troops in North Korea. Um, Indonesia. In Indonesia, the spiritual and mysterious continues to pull on modern, uh, the modern imagination, just as it did in pre-colonial times. And this influence um, continues to compete with evangelical Islam, which has only been around for about, uh, I guess it's 800 years. Vietnam, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, is, is still resisting China, uh, Chinese uh, domination, as it's been doing for over a thousand years. Um, in Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, uh, and indeed in China, the glories of past civilization remain a fixture of school curricula and are very important in the popular imagination. Um, understanding all these changes is not simple, and that's why there's a course about it. <laughs> that's, why, uh, that's also why popular understanding of Asia in the West is so poor. And so much of the media coverage, especially on television, is so awful. Believe me, it's awful. Ah. Um, we do, however, do a lot of business with Asia. And this means that you've got a lot of people from the West interacting with Asia, and a lot of people in Asia interacting with people in the West. Uh, vice versa, everywhere you want to look at it. Big institutions like churches and governments are no longer in the middle. Um, and, and this means that, uh, that um, understanding what's going on in Asia and not misunderstanding it is, is increasingly important in this modern age when uh, individuals can communicate with each other much more readily than before. And it's a potential employment asset. Let me say that again. Employment asset. That's why I want you to pay attention in this course. It's, uh, I hope, a motivation to, uh, to do the work, to learn the material. And there is some amount to do. Um, the reading goes between about 100 pages a week to 160 a week. It's, I'd say it's an average of about 130 pages a week, but this is normal for a 300 series course. There are videos that are intended to enhance the course, um, and of course these uh, lectures I'm giving where I try to, uh, to uh, get into as much detail as possible. So 
and there are films. Uh, besides short videos, there are also uh, feature-length films I want you to see, which uh, do a better job than than almost every, everyone else does of um, depicting certain times of history in Asia. So instead of going down to the Pearl District and uh, or Chinatown on a Saturday night, you don't have to do this every Saturday night, but uh, you can curl up with one of these marvelous films and a cup of tea or a beer, um, but be sure to bring your notebook. Now let's look at these um, two slides here, or rather these two images on slide 15, um, Asia in 1808 and in 1850. We start in 1800 because this, partly because this is the dawn of the industrial age, and indeed the industrial age is a driver of many of the developments we will discuss in this course. This is when uh, Europe's initial advances into Asia um, to do more than just trade began. Uh, we will get into more detail about this, but basically European powers went into Asia simply looking to trade, simply to start up entrepots where they could uh, do their business, ship spices and other desirables back to Europe. But once the industrial age dawned, these European powers were competing with each other and everything changed. Uh, they were competing with each other for uh, dominance and even survival. And so their attitude toward how to deal with Asia, where they found powers that were weaker than them militarily, uh, changed as well. Because what the industrial age brought, of course, was uh, better fire and maneuver and better transportation. Fire and maneuver is a big thing. It's a big influence on history. Military, um, military maneuvers, military power is all about fire and maneuver, and we'll get into more of that uh, later. Um, in this top left map here, you can see there's no colonial penetration. You sort of have to look closely at these illustrations, but they will show us that, that uh, that uh, the Spanish were in the Philippines, the Portuguese were in Macau, a very small entrepot along the South China coast. Um, the Dutch had footholds in Indonesia, but there wasn't very much else for colonial penetration. And these weren't even really colonies except for the Spanish in the Philippines. They actually went in and took over the place. Um, but these other places, the Portuguese and Macau, they were not really there as a colony. The uh, Chinese allowed them to to reside there. It was a much different sort of deal. And indeed, the Dutch were being allowed to reside in some places in the modern day Indonesia. Um, and the only penetration uh, was, was in India by the British. Um, and they were going into Tibet and were trying to displace Chinese dominance in Tibet. Um, and China's influence extended into Southeast Asia. But in the bottom right, you see a maturing colonization. The French are ensconced in Indochina. They have taken the place over. They have overthrown the dynasty. The United, the United Kingdom, the British, are all over Southeast Asia, the, uh, the rest of Southeast Asia. China is still intact, but it has withdrawn to its core, except for Mongolia. Um, and at, at this point, the Northeast was sort of part of its core because this is the Manchu dynasty. These were people from that part of uh, modern-day China. Um, and they maintained some influence that was becoming more and more shaky in Tibet and indeed in Xinjiang, which is to the north of Tibet, the far west of the of modern-day People's Republic. I'm going to stop this one here, and we'll go on to slide 16.